like to begin um, by taking you back in time. One of my earliest memories is of watching my mother captivate audiences with her incredible music. She had a talent for making her passion for music pervasive. And when I turned five, she started giving me lessons. And music has been um, an inherent part of my life uh, since that time. And one of the really fulfilling uh, things for me to do is to share that music with my family and friends, whose reactions and pleasures challenge me to continue to practice and continue to grow. In college, I studied engineering. And I have to say, I did not make the personal connection with engineering that I have with music. In fact, when I learned engineering concepts, I felt like I was learning to play random notes on the piano, except I didn't know what the music sounded like. But there are these landmark moments in your life that can completely change your perspective and how you feel about something. When I was in my fourth year in college, I was diagnosed with the earliest stage of cervical cancer. At that time, I didn't know what that meant. At that time, we didn't know that cervical cancer was caused by the human papilloma virus. At that time, I didn't know that I was one of those unlucky individuals that had HP. But they say everything happens for a reason. About a year later, I met a professor, and she wanted to start a project to develop engineering technologies for cervical cancer. I would have never imagined that I could actually connect what I learned in college to something that was of such personal relevance. I finally found the spark that I was missing, and I looked back. So today, I'm a professor of biomedical engineering and global health at Duke. And what I really enjoy doing is following my passion of working on women's health issues through the lens of engineering. But what I really like to do, what I find really fulfilling, is to be able to share that passion with the students that are a part of my group. One of the observations that I made, or I have been making, is that students, and particularly female students, really gravitate towards engineering and women's health. In fact, I can't tell you the number of times a prospective student has said to me that he or she wants to work in my lab because someone in their life is affected by breast or cervical cancer. So I had an idea, and I reflected on these observations. I thought, could we create a problem-based learning environment anchored on women's health to stimulate students, and in particular women, to pursue engineering so that they could come up with the next generation of technologies for women's health. Who better to advocate women's health than women themselves? So I started the Center for Global Women's Health Technologies to do just this. I wanted to create an environment where like-minded people, faculty, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduate students, high school students, could come together to create sustainable solutions for women's health. And in doing so, I wasn't discriminating against men. I have many male students that I work with and that I enjoy working with. But what I wanted to do was create an environment where there was greater parity and an opportunity to get a women's perspective in the teams that tackled these problems. So one of the goals that I had for the center was the ability for our students to share their passion for engineering. How could we empower them to share their passion for engineering? Well, I drew inspiration from Bunker Roy. Bunker Roy is a social activist and educator who started the Barefoot College in India to teach grandmothers how to be social engineers. So I thought, could we empower our students to embrace their passion for engineering and share that with girls and women in low-resource communities so that they can be engineers too and perhaps create sustainable communities? 
So I'd like to show you the satellite image of electricity in the world. North Carolina is amongst the brightest. East Africa is amongst the darkest. Imagine if we could send a second or third year Duke student across the globe to teach a little girl in an East African rural community how to create her own lighting using renewable energy so she could have light when she's studying at night. She doesn't have to rely on kerosene lanterns or firewood. So what we did is I worked with my postdoc and my graduate students to come up with an engineering experience to do just that. So we created an environment where students, all students at Duke, at Duke can take this, um, where students could come and work on this. So basically, in order to find a problem for them to work on, I was trying to find a community that they could work with. And I met Cheryl Broverman, Duke professor and founder of the NGO Wiser. And she was instrumental in helping me identify the community for which we could provide solutions. Cheryl Broverman started a boarding school in a small fishing community off the shores of Lake Victoria in Uhuru Bay, Kenya. And in this community, many of the girls are victims of sexual violence. And many of them drop out before they ever make it to high school. She has transformed through the school the lives of many of these girls by providing them shelter and more importantly, education. Cheryl pointed out to me that one of the gaps in the education is teaching these girls engineering. Girls in these communities believe that engineering is a man's job. And I thought, what a tremendous opportunity for us to potentially have an impact. When I talked to Kennedy Mugula, the director of science education in the school, I asked him, what can our students teach your students? And he said, renewable energy and light. So, that was what we were going to work on in one of our projects with these students. So basically, we had teams of three that worked together. And we said to them, we want you to build a flashlight based on renewable energy. But you know, they just can't start doing that. They have to first understand. So what they did first is they reverse engineered your standard battery-operated flashlight. They really had to, had to understand every component in order to know how those components dictated the function of that flashlight. Then they get to choose for the preferred renewable energy, and then they have to design a flashlight from scratch. And they actually have to go through the whole process of getting it into a usable product that's nicely packaged. And I think what was really interesting about this experience for both us as instructors and for the students is that it was very, um, it was a very diverse group of people that we were working with. We had first, second, third, and fourth year students, and we had students from the arts and sciences, as well as engineering. And it was interesting to see them work in these teams on a problem that was of such relevance to this community. So here's one of the teams, Annika, Jessica, and Heather. And I just want to point out that Annika is actually not an engineering student. She's an arts and sciences, so this is perhaps her first engineering class that she took. And so they have actually completed their flashlight, their renewable energy-based flashlight. And the way they did that is they used basically a crank, just like you might use a crank in one of those you know, old egg beaters that you might have in the well, I know I have one at home. But basically, you know, you use a crank to essentially have uh, power to your flashlight. And so I just want to show you a very quick video, um, but I want to orient you first because um, when you see this video, you'll see the flashlight at the very bottom of the screen. And so you can watch what happens as Annika starts um, using the crank. So the idea is that these students can actually go through the process of building these tools so that then they can explain it to someone else when they want another person to be able to have that same skill. And I think that Michaela, a junior in mechanical engineering who took this course, I think what she has to say about this really articulates, I think, the 
intent that we had when we offered this experience. That was one of the first experiences that I've had with something engineering coming to life for me. And it made me realize, one, the impact that I can have with such a simple technology in r low resource communities, but also two, how exciting it is and how I wanted to share it with others. So Michaela and um, a group of her peers are actually going to go to Mahura Bay this summer to start an after school engineering club for these 15 and 16 year old girls so that they can learn how to create their renewable energy based flashlights, how they can build radios, and how they can actually build their own microscopes so they can use them in their biology class. And uh, what's really neat about this model is that it also gives us an opportunity to engage our graduate students and our postdocs so that we're able to vertically integrate and learn from each other. So what's great about being able to do this at Duke is that our Duke students are already international travelers. They actually go to low resource communities as part of a number of different programs that Duke offers. So imagine if we can empower these students to be engineers so that they can go there and spread their passion so that they can then teach somebody how to build sustainable skills that can be passed on from one person to another. But also what's important about this process is that these students actually get to be in a community where they get to know the people that live in that community and the, the bigger health challenges that they face. After all, we are striving to make an impact in women's health. And what better way to learn about disparities in health and the challenges that communities face by speaking to the primary caretakers in those communities, women and girls. So what I'd like to do is explain through the cervical cancer example why a women's why a woman's perspective is so important in being able to come up with solutions that are important for women. First, I would like to basically share with you, you share with you this quote which says, this is the beginning of real change led by girls in turning around the perception that girls do not have a place in the field of engineering. And this is actually a quote from Kendi Nkula who's the Director of Science Education at Wiser. And what this quote symbolizes to me is that if we want a woman's perspective on a particular health challenge, then we want to be able to be able to speak to the stakeholders in these communities, but we also want to be able to educate women to tackle those greatest challenges. So in the case of cervical cancer, I'd like to take you to another part of the world. I'd like to take you to Tanzania. So when you think of Tanzania, you might think of Mount Kilimanjaro, you might think of the beautiful safari parks. But Tanzania has a population of 50 million, and two-thirds of that population lives on less than a dollar a day. So they can't afford to go to the hospital or get health services. So what the government has done is created these dispensaries, these little health clinics that serve communities. It's typically staffed by one or two uh, people with a high school education. And then they train health workers that go out into the villages and homes to provide basic health care. These same health workers are the ones that are trained to do pelvic exams on women to check for cervical cancer. And basically, what it involves is a... Um, I can untangle this. A speculum to basically be able to visualize the cervix. A flashlight so you can actually see when you're looking for cancer in the cervix. <coughs> and essentially, this is the same procedure we use in the US, except we use more expensive technology. We use a pulposcope that's about a $20,000 microscope to do the same. So the question is, if we're using the same procedure that we're using here to find cervical cancer, why then is the incidence of cervical cancer in East Africa shown in red 10 times as high as what it is in the US? So being analytical, we try to figure out how, um, what works here doesn't work there. So I think the slide that I'm going to show next captures part of the problem. So this is a well-established NGO that raises money for cervical cancer screening in Tanzania. They say if you provide $20, they get two head labs, like the ones my student built. With the $30, 
you can basically get one metal cycle. And for $120, um, they can provide cervical cancer screening for four women. The number of eligible women in Tanzania for cervical cancer screening is 10 million. And the goal of this organization is to raise enough money to screen 100,000 women. Another fact, the GDP of Tanzania in 2012 was $608. That translates to an average monthly income of, 30, of $50, which is comparable to what a cervical cancer screening costs. And also what's interesting about this problem is most of the cost is not in the parts. It's in the skilled human resources that are needed to actually implement this procedure. And I should point out that the number of health workers per thousand people in Tanzania is two. Yes, it's two. So I think we could throw up our hands in the air and say, this is impossible. This is a big challenge. But we accepted the challenge. And when we tried to find solutions to the problem, we were not overwhelmed by the daunting statistics. What we did is we talked to the people on the ground who best understand what their problems are. We collaborate with the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, and our collaborator, Dr. Aneko, um, has screened thousands of women for cervical cancer, many of whom are from rural communities. And he said to me one day, we were talking, um, he said the biggest challenge that women face um, are that they're afraid to speculate. They don't want to come for a cervical exam because they're very uncomfortable and they're afraid. And he asked me, can you figure out a way to get rid of the speculum? And so what do I do as a professor? I go to my students. <laughs> so I asked my student, Christopher Lamp, who's sitting in this audience, I asked him, um, so how can we use a tampon to find cervical cancer, right? Because I was thinking female um, hygiene, feminine hygiene product. And so um, he came up with an innovative solution that I'll share with you shortly. But before we do that, I want to share some trivia with you. Did you know that the speculum is an ancient device? It actually goes all the way back to the ancient Roman civilization. In fact, the first speculum was excavated in the house of surgeons in Pompeii. And yes, it was a surgical instrument. Then, a little bit more trivia for you today. There was another invention. I like this one. This goes back to the ancient Egyptian civilization. And this was the ubiquitous tampon. And the Egyptian women actually made it out of papyrus. Um, and of course now it's made of different materials. And I presume it was likely invented by the women. So if I was to poll the audience, well, half the audience, the women, and ask them which they would prefer for their next gynecological exam, <laughs> I have a feeling I know what the answer is just from the response I got. In fact, I think I would vote for the So I told my student, you have to you know, meet the women's needs. So this is what he came up with. So here's our $20,000 colposcope, and there's our favorite speculum. Could we essentially consolidate this into one device where now we have essentially the form factor of a tampon, but instead of a tampon, can we actually use something akin to a spy pen? So what does a spy pen have? It has a camera, it has a way to store pictures, and it has a way to transfer those pictures to a computer. Only thing we need, really need to add to this is light because it's dark when you're trying to look at the surveys through the vagina. So the basic idea here I thought was really compelling because if you could use the spy pen and it worked, then instead of having a speculum, what you would have is this tampon that could be inserted presumably by the woman or someone in her family. And at the end of that tampon, you would essentially get light the light would illuminate the surface, you'd get a picture, and then in principle you can transmit that picture to a referral site where someone can make a decision. What's interesting is that there's a potential for cost savings by simply reducing the number of skilled laborers that you would need to do this. And could you imagine perhaps redirecting some of that savings to incent the woman to actually do the exam so she could be an advocate for her own health? so that we can mitigate the bigger burden of treating cervical cancer. Well, there's one more exciting piece of news, which is we didn't realize how um, uh, 
for, I mean, this was fortuitous. When we actually put this device right up next to the servants, we can actually get pictures that are as good as what you can get with a $20,000 device. In fact, if you look at these two images, you know which one is which by the dollar amount. Um, if you look at the top part of the cervix, you can actually see this cauliflower-like pattern, and that's where the disease is. And you can see that in both images, someone looking at the cervix would be able to identify that spot. And you don't need a $20,000 device, and you don't need someone to do it for you. So that was really the idea that transformed the way we thought about it, the solution to this problem. I doubt that a spike idea would have been conceived without an investment. So what I'd like to you know, say is that this has created opportunities for really building a sense of community. We're now collaborating with a number of groups. We're collaborating with uh, people at Duke, like John Schmidt, who's the physician that works with us and also works in Tanzania. And of course, we're collaborating with Dr. Neko of Tanzania. We're also um, doing planning to do studies in Haiti, in Peru, and in India, where the incidence of cervical cancer is staggeringly. So I'd like to conclude by trying to connect these different stories together. You might think this is about using engineering to solve women's health issues. This is about getting more women into engineering. This is about empowering women in low resource communities to create sustainable solutions for their community through engineering. But I'd like to send a broader message. Can we think about engineering like we think about music? Music is an intrinsic part of our culture, and it's pervasive, and it gets passed down over the generations. Children learn, adults learn, and um, it's not really intimidating. It's shared by all. Can we think about making engineering as pervasive as music and make it part of our social culture so that we can build a sense of community that can really make for a more sustainable world. So thank you.